This podcast episode was made possible in part with support from Sacred Rights, a project funded by the Henry Luce Foundation and the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation and hosted by Northeastern University. Sacred Rights is a project that supports public scholarship on religion and provides resources and networks for scholars of religion committed to translating the significance of their research to a broader audience. I recommend you learn more about Sacred Rights on their website at sacred-rights.org or find Sacred Rights on Twitter at sacred underscore rights. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is a podcast where since 2017, I, Greg Soden, have discussed all things religion with a variety of fantastic scholars, historians, journalists, and educators. On this episode, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Sophie Bjork-James. Sophie Bjork-James completed a PhD in cultural anthropology from City University of New York and is an assistant professor of anthropology at Vanderbilt University. She has over a decade of experience researching both the U.S.-based religious right and the white nationalist movements. She is the author of The Divine Institution, White Evangelicalism's Politics of the Family, which came out from Rutgers University Press in 2021, and which also won the Anne Boleyn and Gil Hurt Book Prize. She is also the co-editor of Beyond Populism, Angry Politics, and the Twilight of Neoliberalism. She has been interviewed on NBC Nightly News, NPR's All Things Considered, BBC's Radio 4's Today, and the New York Times, as well as here on Classical Ideas. Her work has received support of the Wenner Gren Foundation for Anthropological Research, the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion, the American Academy of Religion, the National Science Foundation, and the Mellon Foundation. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Sophie Bjork-James. Dr. Sophie Bjork-James, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I am also delighted that you are here. I'm wondering if we can just start off by having you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience so they know a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at Vanderbilt University, so in Nashville, Tennessee. And my research has focused on the contemporary online white nationalist movement, the contemporary religious right. And then I'm currently working on two book projects. One is on how young people understand abortion Mm. in the South. And then the other is on how communities are fighting white nationalism. So very different projects. Uh, But I'm very happy today to mainly talk about my work on Christian nationalism, white evangelicalism, uh, long-term research that I did in Colorado Springs. That was the Uh, basis for my first book, The Divine Institution, which came out three years ago. Fabulous. Well, I'm I'm interested in a little bit in your academic backstory. Tell me about some major turning points in your life that got you interested in anthropology and religion in general. Like how did those uh, those fields kind of come into your into your focus to, you know, help have you like pursue that as a career? Yeah, I think like so many I was going to say academics, but I think people in general, there's a lot of like accidents, you know, there's accidental, Mm -hmm. (laughs) accidental, uh, it's, it feels a little accidental, like how I ended up where I am. I mean, I feel like the long term, my, like my long-term interest as a scholar is really about race and racism and anti-racism and especially how that interacts with environmental issues. I'm very concerned about the climate crisis. I teach about it a lot and it often shapes my interests. And mm. so even when I'm studying something like abortion, you know, I'm also looking at how that fits in with broader with with our, you know, broader moment of experiencing ecological crisis. My scholarly interest is really about race and the environment. <laughs> And Mm. so I feel like what ended up happening is that anthropology just became like a great tool for understanding contemporary social problems. I mean, the best definition I have for uh, anthropology is understanding society from the point of view of its participants. Mm. Right. And so 
it's a great method for you know really having these questions about like well how do people believe this or what does this you know issue actually mean to people or how can right people we ex you know like i was born in the 70s i can tell that the climate has changed since then right people i think born like even 20 years ago can see that you know the climate is changing and yet we there's so much denial of that in the United States, right? So I feel like me methodologically anthropology is a really, is what be, what I came to find is like the best tool for studying the world. And really, I really stumbled into religion because I was interested in white evangelicalism as a political movement. And then was, and then like, so religion kind of came next, right? In terms mm. of looking at, okay, well, I guess, it's so why why you know it's, it was really a, a, about my 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 interest was really about how you know like every day right every especially every Sunday like millions of people go to church looking for you know community community and connection with God and you know sometimes ecstatic worship and yet for white evangelicals they then that experience of going to church and Bible study often ends up shaping a similar political perspective so that when they go to vote into you know into the the ballot box then they often vote similarly mm. uh, and so <clears throat> i became really interested in religion more as like an a, a, a question a question of like how it helps produce views of the political as well let's dive into this book you've got the book the divine institution white evangelicalism's politics of the family which came out from rutgers in 2021 i'm wondering if you can just talk to me about the major purpose of broadly what the book is communicating to readers yeah so i was really interested in you know what i the problem i just laid out right is that how what 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 allows for such political consistency with white evangelicals right since about 1980, white evangelicals have represented around a quarter of the electorate. Uh, and this is, you know, Robert P. Jones's work has shown that that's happened even as their demographics have declined, but they've mm -hmm. remained like overrepresented in the electorate and they vote very consistently around, you know, 78 to 80% for, you know, Republican, the Republican party, but also for, right, they were, White evangelicals were really who pushed put Donald Trump into this, you know, into the candidate first candidacy and then the presidency. And so, I was really curious about what 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 created that kind of political unity. So, you know, I started listening to I I was not raised in that um, like I, I wasn't raised a Christian. I wasn't mm -hmm. raised evangelical, so I had very little experiment experience with that when I started to do this research when I was getting my PhD. So I started to listen to social social media. I was like looking at social media. I was reading, listening to podcasts and reading blogs and, you know, reading books by Christian leader, like evangelical leaders. And so when I finally, I decided to do research in Colorado Springs, which has been called tongue in cheek, the evangelical Vatican, because mm. of so many large influential churches. And at one point there was a hundred evangelical, they call them parachurch organizations or nonprofits located in this one pretty, mm. you know, mid-sized, mid-small size city. Uh, so I first went there in 2008 for summer research and I just started you know, asking, uh, you know, I came to town, emailed every Bible study leader I could find, pastor, media producer, asked for interviews, asked for people to, to meet with. And when I went in, I was after reading a bunch of pro-family leader material, I was really expecting people to be talking about politics all the time. And then mm -hmm. What I found is that it was actually very rare that in the kind of everyday evangelical spaces I spent time in that people talked about politics. The exception was abortion, where people would not talk about it a lot, but, you know, there would be, you know, pro-life flyers when you walked into an event or, you know, they people would circulate a petition, you know, and ask for people to sign like in the actual church. But otherwise, the I mean, the, I was I, I was studying really large churches. And from the main pulpit, you know, some of them, some of the pastors would talk more explicitly about politics, but 
when I started, I kind of expected people, you know, the pastors to say, you know, like, this is who you should, you know, vote for this person. And, you know, kind of talking about the homosexual agenda and like all these kind of political buzzwords and like cultural, you know, the cultural war issues. And I was really surprised to find that that was not happening. I mean, when I first went to Colorado Springs, I remember being uh, trying to explain what I was doing there <laughs> to people. Mm -hmm. And I talked, I remember meeting this one yeah, like young adult Bible, Bible study leader. And he was like, oh, that's so cool. You're a researcher. What are you doing? And like, who are you studying? And so I said, oh, I'm, you know, studying the pro-life movement. And he was like, oh, what's that? <laughs> And I was like, I, you know, I couldn't say, well, it's you, <laughs> but right. I, mm. I said the pro-family movement. I was like, I'm here to study the pro-family movement. And then he was like, oh, what's that? And then, cause like all of the politicized evangelical leaders, that's how they would define themselves as the pro-family movement. And then when I got to Colorado Springs, no one <laughs> referred to that term. No one identified with it. And so then when I was trying, I would, with this one young man, I was like trying to explain him like, oh, I'm, you know, studying groups like focus on the family which, right, it's this in, incredibly large evangelical organization that on the one, one hand, it produces all kinds of media content um, to help families, but it also has a political wing that's fought every expansion of civil rights for sexual minorities mm. for 40 years, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's very involved in politics. They have in every state on the federal level. And yet when I described the, them as political, often people would say in Colorado Springs, like, I don't see them as political, right? I see them as having to defend Christian values, but they aren't actually political. Mm. Versus, whereas like, on, you know, every definition, they've been extremely involved in politics. Um, and so I was really, the book is really exploring what I found in kind of this paradox, right? On the one hand, white evangelicals vote extremely similarly, <laughs> yet they also don't see themselves as part of a social or a, or political movement, right? They, mm. What I came to see is that while well, pastors don't like, and like, you know, I want to be clear, like I'm talking about the pastors that I saw in Colorado Springs, <laughs> right? And like, can't, you know, say that this applies to all evangelicals, sure. but, but from, because, and there, there definitely are some churches that are more explicitly political and will, you know, talk about elections and who to vote for. And we'll talk about more of the culture wars issues. But what I found is that the pastors that I saw didn't explicitly talk about politics, but they would every single week talk about their own families as the mm -hmm. site where they learned about God and got mm -hmm. to live out their Christian faith. And that the family always had to be patriarchal and heterosexual, right? And that it was always a male pastor. The these churches have a very clear gender hierarchy where they're often um, they're not they're not. I studied non-denominational churches, but they <laughs> all follow the exact same format. If they were led by a group of elders who were all men, <laughs> the like lead pastors were all men. Women could be hired as pastors, but only to pastor or minister over children or other women or sometimes like a homeless outreach or uh elder you know pastoral or like you know their homeschool mom something like that but they couldn't women couldn't pastor for men and so there was this gender hierarchy that was just inscribed in the church organization and then with pastors talking always about right their own families as the site where you live out a godly life it came to, i really came to see that the like nuclear family or the patriarchal family and heterosexuality became become like the most central site for white evangelicals, right? And so defending that family becomes a way to defend their faith, right? And that then ties in with all, all of the culture war issues, right? In terms of feminism, in terms of abortion, in terms of LGBTQ rights, yeah, well, you know, and something that I, I'm putting together now as well, since your research is so grounded in anti-racist work, there is a huge section of the book that is specifically about segregation. And I'm curious if you can elaborate a little bit more on that, on how segregation played a role in the research and what you reported in uh, the chapter, The Divine Institution and the Segregated Church. You know, what 
I argue in the book is that, you know, the U.S. has been racially segregated, um, you know, since the country was founded, right? The we're by all accounts, we are just about as segregated racially, residentially as we were during Jim Crow, Mm -hmm. right? Those things haven't really changed. But I feel like that gets naturalized in uh, and like not necessarily seen as a problem or as a structural force. But for evangelicalism, the landscape that we have today is very much shaped by the church growth movement that happened in the 1970s. And, a, you know, and this was a kind of commitment to evangelizing, increasing evangelization within one's country and also, but also abroad. And so, mm-hmm. Really, this is where we see the expansion of evangelicalism in the United States in the 1970s, which is when evangelicals, there's like a mass migration from the more mainline churches, like Methodist, into um, the evangelical denominations, so like the Southern Baptist or non-denominational churches, etc. But this is also where we see start seeing uh, massive conversions all over the world. but a cornerstone of the church growth movement was this belief that the language was really explicit, that like man is more likely to convert to a new religion if they can stay within their own cultural milieu, whether that be an ethnic group, a racial group, mm-hmm. a regional group, right? And that there, so it, like kind of maintaining societal divisions and trying to cre- expand evangel- evangelizing within those divisions is going to have more success, right, than trying to have a, right, like a multiracial, like to try to challenge, right, those divisions. And so you that's why you see like, you know, mo- so many evangelical churches are so segregated mm. and that that was really a foundation of that. But that uh, and so it really shapes kind of the views of the political, right? Because another, like a, a key aspect of this is that for white evangelicals, they really, um, and there's been, you know, a lot of research about this for a very long time, but really don't see structure, right? It's they hmm. see their entire theology is based on relation relationships, right? And so uh, you know, that relationships are meant to foster accountability. And there's always, it's always, they're always meant to be hierarchical. So there's always meant to be, you know, someone who submits and someone with authority. And those relationships are meant to be how one kind of develops a relationship with God, because you're always, everyone needs to learn how to submit to God. And so every relationship is a model for that, but that therefore it, it can't be equal equal, right? There's always a follow, there's always an authority in, in someone who's submitting. And then gender becomes the key kind of framework for this. Yeah. And well, I mean, that really goes nicely into the next chapter too, because it's got a lot of uh, paternalism and paternalist power. And that matters a lot in your work. It re- recurs in a couple of chapters, but there's this chapter about the strict fa- father theology that, um, I think is really worth diving into here as well. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and expand on that? Cause I feel like that goes very well from the submission stuff that you were just talking about and like who has power and who doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was, it was interesting. Like I, when I, you know, with, when I think about how like Catholicism, like Mary is such an important figure in Catholicism. And I mean, I think I heard, pastors talk about Mary like maybe a few times in, Mm -hmm. you know, when they were telling a story about Jesus, but there's no female kind of figure that gets a lot of kind of attention, right? Within evangelicalism, it's um, all about Jesus and God, right? And the Holy Spirit, but it's very much couched in this paternal framing, right? And so the, you know, God is very much seen as the father, right? The, uh, one of the pastors whose church I attended um, frequently during my research gave this one sermon about, you know, it was such a, a a beautiful kind of counter to the, you know, the sinners in the hands of an angry God <laughs> sermon mm-hmm. that, you know, the Puritan sermon that like so many of us have had to read at some point in school. <laughs> but like the the evangelical pastor was, you know, it was like his sermon was basically like, we are all in the hand 
of a loving God, right? And a loving dad, right? And that that dad wants, or God, see, I'm even getting confused. God wants to be a present father for you. He wants to have a relationship with you. And I felt like it was actually became a way for a lot of congregants to kind of deal with the um, struggles they had with their own fathers, <laughs> mm. right? The rejections, sometimes violence, right? All these like issues that people have from their, um, from their own fathers became, I think, healed sometimes because they, like their relationship with God became also a paternal relationship and was explicitly talked about. Um, but then the other, so, and so the other side of that is that fathers also become stand-ins for God. So there's the, you know, this, the same pastor one time preached about how, you know, he was, he was giving, giving, giving this example of how he needs, he teaches his kids to respect his authority. And so he was talking about, you know, when we're at home and I call up the stairs for them to come down, uh, you know, there's no calling their names a second time because they know that they have to listen to me. Otherwise there will be consequences. And that if they learn to listen to my voice and like respond to me, then they will also learn to listen to God. Gotcha. Right? And, and he said explicitly, he was like, my voice is the voice of God to them. <laughs> mm. wow. Right. And so there's very much the sense that like fathers become the, yeah, a stand in for God. Right. And yeah. that they're, and, and like very much like the, the kind of institution of the family as a patriarchal, explicitly patriarchal institution is very, like, a, you know, this, this kind of symbolic representation of the church and yeah. of one's relationship with God. Well, and the, there's a limitation on God's love as well that you talk about in one of the chapters too with regards to same-sex attraction. And so discussing LGBTQIA rights has become a lot more mainstream in the last decade, especially in the way it varies among religious congregations in the United States. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit on that too, because I found that the limit of God's love aspect to be really interesting, but also thinking about this in the larger context of the expansion mm -hmm. of you know, rights in the last like decade or so. Um, how is this coming up in your work that you're seeing yeah. in this book? <laughs> well, and you know, the thing is, is that they, the evangelicals I knew, they would not say that there was a limit to God's love. They would say, God loves everyone. He will just reject <laughs> people who identify as being gay or lesbian or trans. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, but that he'll still love them. Right. But the, what I did find is that the experience for people um, who came out as, you know, gay or lesbian or trans was often that they would be rejected from their entire community and through that feel like they were rejected from God. I mean, I went to, um, they're now called Q, but for a while they were called the Gay Christian Network Conferences and they were, you know, for people who identified as being gay or lesbian or trans, uh, and Christian. And there are so many examples during, from that conference of people, I mean, innumerable ones of people who lost their entire families, their congregations, you know, sometimes like, <laughs> yeah, um, because they came out as either, you know, LGBTQI plus, or they came out in support of, uh, gay rights, right? Like I interviewed a, a pastor here in Tennessee who, talked about he had he was an evangelical pastor who had a transformation where he came out in support of LGBTQ rights. He still identified as a cis heterosexual man and he lost his congregation. He got hmm. his his wife divorced him <laughs> hmm. over this theological difference, right? Um and so the consequences of were extreme, but in terms of ostracism, but there was very much a sense that you know, one could be a sinner in like all, many different ways, right? I mean, I had, and even around sexual sin, like I had so many, I had so many interviewees like admit to, you know, pornography addictions to, you know, adulterous relationships to uh, like all, many different, you know, sin, much less like the sins of like gluttony and pride, right? And, um, but none of them were seen as threatening one's relationship with God. I mean, they were, mm. they were seen as that they were seen as, you know, if I sin that it gets between me and God and therefore it's like, 
but it's not that it's very much a different kind of separation that happens if if there's even just support for sexual diversity in that one loses everything right including their relationship with god and so many people you know so many people i interviewed a number of people who identified as either ex-gay so having formerly identified as homosexual and now identify as having left homosexuality or people who identify as like they it's kind of a joke where they say they're xx gay right where they tried to leave homosexuality and then they realized okay i can't I'm, i am you know gay or lesbian or trans and you know so many of those people they really were like when they struggled with their you know when they were struggling and thinking like oh my gosh i might be gay i might be a lesbian you know I'm, i might be trans that that experience meant that they one thought they could never have a family and two that they could not have a relationship with god mm. anymore right and yeah. so it's very much a foundation of and i think of of kind of evangelical you know religious and political life that they really see that if they're not heterosexual they can't be part of this like patriarchal family they can't be in god's family and so i think it's it really shows, you know, on the one hand, it's not new to say, okay, white evangelicals are against <laughs> sexual diversity and LGBTQ rights, right? That's something we, it's wide evidence, we know that. But I think that what I found is that it's very much also, it's not just a political issue. You know, you can't separate these out. You can't say it's political or theological, but very much combined. Right. Well, okay, so the book concludes with the Trump first presidency um and i'm wondering what are we looking at now for the next possible five years in relation to your work what has got you thinking about that conclusion chapter and like where we are now and where we might go yeah there's so much i mean honestly there's just so much research that still needs to be done on this because i think the last you know nine years have changed like our political landscape so much. And so for white evangelicalism, I think there's many different possible directions. I mean, there's been fissures around where a lot of congregations that were becoming more multiracial, a lot of the people of color have been leaving because of the like more explicit politicization. Um, I think the younger people are have left in even higher rates than before over political fissures and so but you know i don't think it's it but it also seems like you know the uh, what we're seeing from national polling is that it's white conservatives in general are ex adopting much more author authoritarian and anti-democratic views um accepting the possibility of political violence more um and so i think white evangelicals are definitely part of that trend um mm. unfortunately um and yeah i think that there's like that unfortunately is probably going to be what we see more and i think that partly relates to the fact that we're seeing such demographic change right that we if we kind of take a step back and think about like okay well what is how to understand our current political moment is that you know that we're expected that somewhere in the next 20 years we will you know the us will move from a white majority country to a white minority country and that has so many white conservatives just in a panic honestly mm -hmm. and white evangelicals be you know they say that they're not they're focused on conservative values and on religion but race is central to their theology it's central to how they live their lives it's like um it's incredibly central to their fears of a changing country right because yeah. even like you know like when i was doing my research when obama was president and no one thought of him as a christian right i mean there was like one um you know there was this one uh podcast between so james dobson the founder of focus on the family and uh someone in the southern baptist convention a leader of the southern baptist convention and they were just picking apart they were like well you know obama's christianity is just skewed he doesn't understand what christianity is right and so yeah. it's this idea that there isn't just like the you know like they 
it's the, like white evangelical theology stems from the history of white supremacy that denies the kind of reality of structural racism and then they can turn around and say oh well so black christianity or black theology that instead tries to challenge racism that's wrong religion <laughs> mm. right that is la that is like not the real religion and so yeah it's uh it's definitely uh very up in the air about where we go from here but I'm delighted that you are so involved in the conversation. Um, you know, I know that you've done stuff with uh, NBC Nightly News, NPR, All Things Considered, BBC Radio 4, The New York Times, New Books Network. Um, tell me a little bit about your view on your involvement in being a publicly facing scholar at this time, like in your career. Yeah. So for me, I mean, I, it's been really important for me to not just write for academic audiences, but to speak to a broader public. I think more academics need to do that. And it's frustrating because like many academics, when I was like earlier in my career, I got a lot of advice saying, don't do it. <laughs> It'll only cause negative things, right? Like you can be taken less seriously as a scholar. <laughs> which I just think is absurd, especially in our current moment. I just feel like for me, the stakes are too high in our current moment around, I, I support democracy. I want my children to grow up in a democracy and that is not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, any kind of scholarship that um, can be shared with a broader public to try to show the stakes of our current moment and like new, like so that people can understand more nuance and under of what's happening i think is really important and so for me doing public facing work has always been really central um so yeah i've been happy to be able to do some you know uh um writing for more popular journals um yeah i was interviewed with by the new books network podcast and, yeah and yeah talking to journalists cool big part How of my you... work how do you assess the risk versus the reward of doing that kind of stuff? Because whenever you do work like that, you draw attention to yourself in certain ways, some good, some bad. How do you, how do you balance all that? Yeah, I think it's important just to question every time, you know, and I think that I've, I've, I've definitely in the past, sometimes I've just said yes. And I'll be like, even if I think the framing of a story isn't great I'll say yes because I'll want to I'll be like well I can help reshape or influence a different <laughs> like interpretation or more nuance and so but I've come to like realize some you know as this is goes specifically with talking to journalists is that if I feel like someone is just writing something just to have it be clickbaity <laughs> hmm. that I'm not gonna I'm just gonna say no because it's you know I don't think it actually we we i have to recognize and scholars have to recognize that you know we're it's very easy for our work to reinforce polarization and stereotypes and that's not what i want to do like that's already happening enough i feel like what if i can add nuance or more like a complete understanding to some to a story then i'm happy to talk about that um but i think it's also i think in some ways the tide has turned and that there's more support now for public scholarship because of our changed political climate. Um, and yeah, and I, so, so for me, it's more about, um, yeah, recognizing a responsibility to participate. What kind of uh, goals do you have in public scholarship? Do you have any things that you have like on your bucket list for what you want to do? Oh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a great question. I feel like just getting more leading up to this current, this upcoming election, the stakes are so high. So I feel like having just more being able to like share, you know, encourage more people to be involved in the political process is, is a huge goal of mine. Wonderful. Well, I am delighted, uh, to you know, feature your work on the podcast. I am excited to talk about the Divine Institution, White Evangelicalism, Politics of the Family, which came out from Rutgers earlier, as I said, and everybody can still find. Um, really nice overview of the book. I'm really glad that we kind of like went through it like piece by piece like that because the chapters are 
just really were were resonating with me as I was going through. I was like, man, these topics are so relevant. Every single every single chapter are things that I've been paying pretty careful attention to over the last few years. And it's nice to deepen my own understanding of all those specific issues of what's going on with a major demographic and voting block in the United States, especially in an election year. So um, Dr. Sophie Bjork James, is there anywhere that you would like to draw people's attention to if you would like to promote anything or, um, you know, tell people where they can find you if they want to follow along with more of your work. Yeah. Thank you. Just first, thank you so much for such great questions. And it's always, it's always so nice to talk to a really engaged reader. Um, so yeah. And my book was just reprinted, so it is available. Uh, you Wonderful. Can find, you can find it on, you know, uh, bookshop or Amazon or, or at Rutgers university presses. Um, website and yeah, to, there's uh, you. I have a I have my a personal website, sophiebjorkjames.com, um, that has in, uh, links to all of my writing. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>